Thank you. It's uh, great to be here. I know a couple of you. We've got a really small group, so this can be very informal. Um, if people want to ask questions as I'm going along, please just jump right in and raise your hand. Um, I'll just give a little more introduction of who I am. Let's get the Wi-Fi ad off here, first of all. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I'm an architect. I uh, have been at the University of Minnesota most of my career in different research centers. And uh, mostly I started the Center for Sustainable Building Research back in the mid-90s in the College of Design and was there for 17 years as the director. Um, and uh, some of the work I'll talk about goes back to that, where we set up all the energy efficiency standards for buildings in Minnesota and so forth. Um, and then uh, three and a half years ago, I, I stepped down from as director, but I'm still doing some part-time work on some interesting projects. And I work with the Minnesota Design Center, which is more of a city planning or an urban design center. So I'm going to talk about two things tonight. One is energy efficient buildings and the role solar can play in them. And then the second thing is um, this community scale or neighborhood scale design. I spent most of my life looking at individual buildings and now I'm involved in things uh, in Rochester and Prospect Park, the Ford site and places around town where people are trying to look at how do we make a neighborhood zero energy or sustainable. So, that's what I'm going to talk about. It isn't all about renewable energy, but I think it relates strongly to renewable energy because you can't, you can't, uh, you can't just look at the energy supply side. You really have to consider how to keep the loads down in buildings and the infrastructure. So, um, this. This is just a diagram to, to, I don't need to explain all these things in detail by any means, but it's just to prompt me to tell you the little bit of the history. Back in 2004, we created what's called the B3 Building Design Guidelines, and it's required on all state-funded projects. It was something the legislature <coughs> asked us to do. And it's, if you've heard of the LEED building system, it's kind of like the Minnesota version of the LEED, where it gives you a number of requirements for energy and water and site and materials and indoor health. And then in 2008, we had a great opportunity to raise the bar on energy. Uh, the legislature was inclined to support <coughs> what's called the SB 2030 program, Sustainable Buildings 2030. And that is a a big leap forward in terms of uh, you know where we're going to get to with energy and buildings, and it's required, as I said, on all the projects in uh, that are funded by the state. But then it's used uh, this SB 2030 program by cities, counties, other communities. It's it's available for other people to use. Um, what's interested, interesting about it is the basis of it. You see that little bar graph over there guy named uh, Ed Masria was an architect back in 2004 or 5, I think. He said, you know, we're not going to, if we really are serious about climate change, if we're really serious about saving energy, we can't just be 10% better or 20% better and just keep kind of nibbling away at it. We have to set a goal and we have to recognize that for climate change to reverse, we've got to be at zero energy with all our building stock by the year 2030. Mm -hmm. And then he said, let's put a stake in the ground. Hello? It won't reverse. I, yeah, I should, that was probably a, that was a poor, poor choice. But well, you know, the book I'm reading now is called Drawdown, which is by um, uh, this, oh God, I'm going to forget his name. It'll come back to me. But anyway, it's, it's about trying to find that peak and then pulling it back down again. But uh, you're right. That reverses the wrong choice of word. Carbon dioxide is different from peak of energy. Right. No, no. I know. But at least to level off, to, to not see this ever-increasing um, contribution to greenhouse gases. So the idea behind 2030, anyway, is if you want to get there, you have to start somewhere. You can't do it all overnight. And he said, here we are, and let's look at the building stock right now in 2004, and let's 
uh, let's say that by 2010, all buildings have to be 60% better than that. And by 2015, they have to be 70% better. And by 2020, they have to be 80% better, and we get to 100% better, which is essentially net zero energy by the year 2030. So he, uh, he created that program and got a lot of publicity and so forth, but we're actually one of the only states that has implemented it in a very strong and organized way and created all the, the tools and, and information to help architects get there. So this is a, a pretty interesting and impressive program. So we're now at this point, I guess I could use my pointer on here. Does this, does this work? It's a little hand, okay. So we started back here in 2004. We set this standard at 2010. Now people uh, up until 2015 had to meet this standard. Now when we get to, and that's where we are now, when, when we get to 2020, it's gonna kick in at an even higher level. It's gonna raise the bar again. And uh, the renewable energy part of this, the state doesn't absolutely require renewable energy, but it defines it as on-site solar and wind for these buildings. Uh, all projects are required to evaluate two systems, and if the payback is less than 15 years on the renewable energy system, they're supposed to go ahead and apply it. So it uh, um, be interesting to see if people are seriously doing that analysis and acting on it. You'd be a good, I'm looking at Terry here who works for one of the state agencies. You know, the engineers were saying it wasn't viable, it wasn't viable, but residentially it is viable. It's like a six to eight year payback. Now, I work for Minnesota State Colleges and Universities and they can't take advantage of tax rebates. So the payback ends up being longer for state right. buildings. Right. So what I'm told by the people who are running this program now and looking at all these buildings is we're, we're getting at the point where solar has gotten cheap enough that we're getting close to where that you could do it with a 15 year simple payback. Um, but the other thing that's kind of exciting is when we go to 2020, they feel like we can't reduce the building loads that much more and we're gonna really be pushed into having to put renewables on every building if people really enforce this and follow through on it. So we're, we're probably at a critical turning point where both the, the cost will come down and the, uh, the bar that they're trying to meet is high enough that they have to use renewables. So, so yeah. the baseline is 2004? Yeah, so yeah. So then we're coming in with respect to that year. Yeah, and, and you know, in, in a sense, where you start is a little bit arbitrary. It was just like, let's put a stake in the ground and then work our way down to this. If you look at the building code, though, that's for a typical building in 2004. You know, our building code today, and the building codes keep getting better, the minimum you can build is probably about 50% below that benchmark. So the building code would put you, would put you pretty close to this 2010 mark. You know, so we're really getting you to come 20 or 30 percent better than that. We're not trying to get you to come 70 percent better so, than the so building. Are they code. Doing that with insulation, or um, how are they doing that? Maybe that's what you're not talking about. Well, I'm not. I'm, we, well, let's uh, let's go through this a little more, and then I can try to answer that question. But there's a whole range of strategies, and they're different for commercial buildings than they are for residential. Yes. Two percent. Non-site renewable. That's it. That's. I'm sorry. I just. But yeah, I know. You have a big building. Two percent of a college university is actually can be sizable. It's it's more like you've got to start somewhere. <laughs> Once we turn that corner and, and the market changes, I think then the idea is it will go up. But yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> Okay, so anyway, um, I'm giving you an overview today. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but if you're interested in following through with this, the, um, you go to these websites for B3 or 2030 program, and you would find a whole database of the hundreds of state and other Minnesota buildings that have followed this program. So it's, it's, uh, you know, it's given us an opportunity now to to measure what's going on and track these things. 
And of course, they're all different types. And uh, you, you don't have the same target for every building type. Like a hospital uses more energy than an office building. An office building uses more energy than an apartment building. So we have a, you know, a way that you put in the characteristics of the building and it will say the target for your particular building with its uses and its operation is this. And it might be that an office building is supposed to be a number like 30 kBTUs per square foot per year and energy use per square foot per year. And a hospital, a good use there might be 120, it might be four times as much. So it's a, it's a somewhat sophisticated way of setting a target. It isn't a, um, a dumb way. When you go into this case study database, again, you, you could look at a facility like this It'll describe the facility, but most importantly, it'll, it'll give you this little scorecard here um, that shows energy and uh, carbon and water and uh, this is wastewater, I believe. Or no, that's one of those, the stormwater one's wastewater. In any case, it shows you, you know, where the requirement is and where the building falls on this. So this seems really simple, but in the world of buildings, it's amazing how we don't do this very much. We kind of build them and walk away from them and pay the energy bills. Most, um, even big institutions, don't actively manage and try to reduce their energy use. They just kind of treat it as a cost that they can't control. Um, so being able to track them, and then year to year, all these buildings are required to submit their energy bills. There's a big benchmarking program, which means all public buildings in Minnesota have to continue to submit their energy bills. And this allows us to see if they're actually doing what they said they were going to do during design. And it, it's the kind of thing that's just a good feedback loop. It's just a good way of... Uh, of uh, managing things. And then occasionally you'll get one that where the energy use goes way up and that, that's a, a way to diagnose that there's a problem in the building or it might be telling you, no, they're now got twice as many people and they're operating two shifts so they had to increase the energy. So there's nothing wrong with the building. It just is a change in, in patterns. So anyway, that, that's the, um, that's this statewide program we have and I think it's been very successful and uh, the reason Doug invited me here was I was giving presentations to cities and counties about how they can adopt this and use it, use it for their purposes. Now one of the places that's adopted this program is the city of St. Paul. And uh, one of the tricky challenges is you're not allowed by law to, um, a city can't just say, we're now increasing our building code. We're gonna make every building that gets built in St. Paul be, uh, you know, a zero energy or whatever standard they want to pick, or, or they could say it's going to be a lead building or whatever. They are not allowed to do that because the state says everybody has to have the same base energy code. We can't let it fluctuate. In other states, they've gone back to their legislatures. The city of Boston has a higher standard than the Massachusetts does as a whole, and, and it's, it happens in some places, but here we can't force that. So the workaround that the city of St. Paul came up with is said, well, we give to most major projects that are built in St. Paul, they come to the city and ask for some form of money, you know, tax increment financing or utility work around the building, something. So once you're, once you're asking the public sector for some help, then we can, um, we can turn around and impose on, on the building all sorts of things. I mean, there's lots of things other than energy and sustainability that they impose on buildings when they say, we're gonna give you some money, but you have to use union labor or do this or do that. There's, there's all sorts of things, but it gives them leverage. So it's a, it's a pretty clever idea and so now, for any building in St. Paul that receives 200,000 or more in city funding, um, they're required to use this new higher set of guidelines. Is and that including tax and commercial financing, things like the soccer stadium? Yeah, so there you go. There's the list of all these different ways. Now, um, I believe the soccer stadium tried to write a clause to get themselves out of it. But I'm not sure what the stat, how that ended up. <laughs> I just remember 
one of the people in St. Paul telling me about that when they cut these deals. So, but anyway, yes, that would anything, any anything of you know of, of any size, especially for housing, all that stuff is getting government money in various ways. So, what was challenging in putting together this program though was how do you really do this because. You know, you can't just say everybody needs to use the B3 program or everybody needs to use the LEED program because you have, every building is different. If you get money from affordable housing uh, funds in Minnesota, you're required to use one set of green building standards called green communities. If you get money from the state, you have to use our B3 guidelines. The Port Authority imposes some guidelines, I believe. And some people might say, well, I want to use LEED because that's the brand I want for my building. So. It's all over the place. So we said, that's fine. You can use any of those. Use whichever one you want. But we just, there's five uh, or six places where we want you to meet a target. We still want you to meet an energy target no matter what guidelines you're using. So that's kind of the premise of this. So that you've got to still go in and use just the 2030 part, the energy part of this. And then you, you also have to meet a target with potable water, landscaping water, certain stormwater standards, greenhouse gas emissions have to be calculated and reported, and then your energy data has to be uh, reported every year. And that's what, you, that's what you're required to do in exchange for getting that city money. So they've run about 50 buildings through this in the last few years in St. Paul, and I think it's been you know, really successful. Now, they don't have a specific renewable energy requirement, but if you do something like LEED or B3, those things tend to include some kind of push you in the direction of renewable energy. They don't let out require it though. So I'll just pause there for a minute. So now we have communities around Minnesota pretty interested in adopting this kind of program. The one I've been working with the most lately is uh, Rochester. They're doing their big destination medical center redevelopment of downtown Rochester. <coughs> and they've got a new set of requirements and standards and they're doing this kind of thing, this V3 2030 thing. So d does anybody have any questions or comments about buildings or building these building programs? I can go back to the question you asked, Don. Oh, oh um, I guess. Technically, so are you putting insulation in walls? Are you taking old houses and retrofitting, or is this something different? Most of this is commercial buildings, although it's big multifamily residential as well. Okay. Terry's an architect who does this every day, she could tell you. What I would do is say there's, there's a compliment. When you start doing one thing, it doesn't give you the full value, but if you start to do a multitude of things, there, there's a synergy. So for instance, when you add insulation to your walls and your roof, and let's say you change your light fixtures from uh, incandescent to LEDs. Suddenly your heat load in the building and your cooling load decreases. So your HVAC system gets smaller. And so there's a lot of, you know, in snowballs, it all, it's, it's, a, it's a parts, it's more, the, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Yeah, another good example of that is if you put really high quality windows, maybe even triple glaze windows on a building, um, then you make the heating and cooling system much smaller. So you, the money you put into the windows, you save on that, and the net result is 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 a, a major improvement. And I'd say, you know, these kind of guidelines and systems were coming out, were being invented in the 90s, and then they kind of emerged in the marketplace and have become strong in the, um, you know, the profession has been working with these things for 10 or 15 so, years. So there's a lot of built up knowledge on how to do this now. So are the guidelines for new buildings? Um, and large renovations. And renovations. And large renovations. Oh. Yeah. I think it's, it's a lower bar on renovation because you can't control everything. But yeah, both both of these are done for that. So um, the second part of the talk mm -hmm. that uh, I'd like to address is, is this idea of community design. And I wasn't. You know, I was new to this uh, 10 years ago. Uh, I mostly just worked with, with buildings. And I think in general, every, the, the, the world of energy and sustainability was kind of turning its attention 
to how can we work at the bigger scale, not just the individual buildings, because there's special things we can do. We can look at a campus, we can look at district energy, we can manage stormwater and things in different ways when we look at a group of buildings. And you're also looking at um, things that a, a building doesn't really touch, like how do we put housing units and commercial and workplaces on the landscape so that we're reducing transportation, we're not separating these things. How do we, so it, it brings into, uh, into the equation all of these other issues of, uh, of uh, transportation in particular, but land use. So my introduction to this was Umore Park. How many of you have heard of Umore Park? It's 5,000 acres down in Rosemont. Uh, that was given to the University of Minnesota in 1947 um, by the federal government. Back then, it was a, they were building a munitions plant for World War II out there, and it was way out in the country, of course. And it was given to them for nothing, and they used it over the years for like agriculture experiment station and things like that. But it's been just sitting there as an undeveloped area that's about the size of a suburb. Somebody told me it's about the size of the diner or St. Louis Park or something, 5,000 acres. So anyway, that's this map. And then about 10 years ago, 10, maybe 12 years ago, people at the university said, why don't we do something productive with this? You know, should we sell it? Should we? And, and the idea uh, came that we were going to develop a new community out there that was going to be research based. It was kind of, an, it's a place we could do innovative research on a quote unquote sustainable community of the future. So there was a lot of interest in that. You got all of the top level faculty in every area working on committees and planning this thing. And, uh, and uh, I was a, a part of that. And it was really an exciting introduction to that possibility. There was always, and you've got essentially free land and one landowner, so that was that was great. Very little has actually happened. So I'd say the, the lessons, there were a couple things going on at the time. One was people were saying, why are you doing it out there? You know, that what's sustainable about doing it out in the out in the periphery of the metro area? Shouldn't it be in the center? And uh, sort of envisioning all this car driving and transportation associated with it. And it would be, I think it's an idea that might be ahead of its time. If you had a rail that ran from Minneapolis to Rochester and, and had a stop there, then that would make perfect sense. That would be your kind of transportation link that would relieve um, all the driving associated with being out here. But the other idea was, no, why can't we have workplaces and homes together? And it doesn't mean everybody's a commuter going into the downtown area every day. So. You know, there's some logic to creating sustainable small towns or suburbs. Um, but anyway, um, but the, ultimately what killed it was the recession in 2008. I think right when they were ready to roll ahead with some of this, the housing market completely collapsed and the development couldn't go ahead for a few years. And then um, there was a change in leadership at the university and they just pulled back and didn't want to want to do it anymore. Isn't there yeah. an expense to cleaning up? There's some. Um, I'm not, I don't know the details of that. I don't think it's a huge impediment. I mean, you got the Rice Creek site up in Arden Hills. It's got huge issues that way, too. Somebody wants me to join their internet <laughs> badly here. So anyway, um, and we had you know, these world-class designers come in, and, and this is just an example of a plan. And of course, the value of the land, and the reason, one of the reasons the university felt they had money to develop it is that that whole area is uh, full of great sand and gravel. And so these lakes there are going to be open pit sand and gravel mines, and that's, that's an ongoing process, and the university's making a lot of money off of that to begin with. So that gave them the you know, part of the economics to pursue these ideas. So it was a huge learning experience. I think it got a lot of people uh, in town interested in this kind of idea, but maybe it was the wrong place in the wrong time. 
the next one that um, I was involved with through the centers at the university was is in Prospect Park, which is a neighborhood right adjacent to the university. Um, there's the Green Line now, the new LRT line runs downtown Minneapolis to downtown St. Paul, stops at the campus, and it has stations in this area along University Avenue. Well, this particular area has lots of empty or underdeveloped industrial land, and so it was seen as a, a new community within the city that could be um, a demonstration of, again, a sustainable, highly efficient, healthy, and other things community. And this is a little map of it. Here's University Avenue. There's the Gopher Football Stadium. And here's the LRT train travels through here. And there's one of the stops. So we were involved in helping them plan the community, you know, create like a central green space around the station and create a walkable urban environment and so forth. And this project was really my. I think my, under, my growth in terms of understanding what a multi-dimensional problem it is that we're trying to attack when we look at a, a community design like this. I think in the world of buildings, you know, you can focus narrowly and worry about energy and water use and these kind of specific technical things. But when you're planning a community, um, there's, it's not just about those systems not just about infrastructure and money, it's about the people that are there, it's about the kind of environment you create and so forth. So out of our work with them, this vision developed that was, uh, the outer ring has these eight components and research and innovation is, is really the heart of this. They say, we want a research park next to the university where businesses and professors and students can interact and have incubator businesses and have that kind of um, exciting collaboration and innovation that drives the economy. So that's one part of it, but they also said we need, uh, we want a sustainable and resilient city, we want a healthy city, and we want it to be diverse and equitable, and all these people from affordable housing or Blue Cross Blue Shield in the health world or uh, you know, the sustainability world, design, art, and culture, everyone came together around the idea of creating, it's very much like Umore Park, envisioning the community of the future. And so it's a wonderful opportunity. And what you find is that the decisions you make are multi-faceted. In other words, you don't, you don't do something just because it saves energy. You actually, if you create a really nice, walkable, likable pedestrian environment in a neighborhood like this, connected to transit, you're gonna save energy because people drive their cars less. But you're also going to, people are gonna have health benefits because they're gonna be walking or biking more. And you're going to have, uh, because there's more life on the street and people out on the street, you're gonna have a more vibrant public realm which also contributes to health and safety in the sense that uh, social cohesion, all these things flow together. And then um, when you're trying to attract companies like Amazon, for example, everybody's talking about that these days, this is the kind of young people and entrepreneurial people that are they're attracted to places like San Francisco and New York. They're not necessarily looking to be out in the suburban office campus anymore, and so they want to be in the city. They want to be in an industrial, mixed-use, exciting, interesting area. And so uh, and so, Prospect Park was envisioned as that type of place. So that, that in, just in itself, has been a, a wonderful learning experience for everybody involved. And the other thing about Prospect Park is, and by the way, it's now called Tower Side, because it's 370 acres that includes uh, property over on the St. Paul side. So it's a joint Minneapolis-St. Paul venture. It's been passed by both of the city councils and defined as, a, as an innovation district. And, uh, and so it's, um, what was I gonna say about that? I forgot. So anyway, it's, it's moving forward. Um, and the other part of our role in all of this, and this gets back to energy and sustainability, was writing the guidelines. How do you plan this community? And 
guidelines, I suppose they're kind of like a boring set of rules, you could think of them that way, but in many ways, they're, they're, they can be very powerful in terms of shaping what actually has to happen there. So this, this page is showing the guidelines, they're kind of like the basic principles of a good community design. This is the guidelines for the district as a whole. And you see things like district energy, district stormwater, district parking, other district systems, perhaps there's gonna be wastewater, biogas generation, all these kind of things integrated into this. Um, in the public realm, you're creating beautiful, walkable public spaces. In the development itself, you're looking for mixed uses. You're not trying to segregate things and say, here's retail, here's housing, here's workplace. We're trying to mix them all together, so changing zoning so that works. And then um, having a diversity of housing types so that you're, you're mixing ages and um, lifestyles and income <coughs> levels and uh, doing all that. And, and, oh, I know what I was gonna say, but what, what's interesting about Prospect Park, unlike many places, is this thing is really driven by the neighborhood. There's a historical neighborhood there, of beautiful houses, a lot of the professors at the university live there. But they said, we want density. We want a big development next to us because it'll bring groceries and activities and commercial things and stuff. It won't hurt our neighborhood, it'll help our neighborhood. So, and it isn't a top-down thing. It isn't the city saying, we're going to do this. It's bottom up from the neighborhood. These are guidelines related to the buildings themselves. So everybody that comes in and wants to build there has to connect to the district systems. Uh, they have to abide by certain principles, like uh, you know, trying to preserve historic structures where possible so we keep the character of the place. Uh, this is, by the way, a place with all these big grain elevators. That's kind of the, the symbol of it. And people think that's really cool. You know, the Surly Brewery opened their big beer garden, restaurant, and brewery there. And they've got a big backdrop of these grain elevators, and they have light shows on it. And people love that. My kids live in Brooklyn. It reminds me of Brooklyn. It's like this old gritty industrial area. And, you see some old factory and next door is like a really exclusive restaurant or hotel in a grubby building. <laughs> so I think that's what people want. So, um, so anyway, this is just a list of those things. In terms of, uh, in terms of solar and renewables, the two key things we ask people to do is flat roofs and design roofs so they can accommodate future solar uh, and future green roofs if possible. Um, and also on the bottom, um, this is where we try to do the St. Paul SB 2030 approach. Raise the bar, get everybody on board with doing higher energy standards and so forth. And you have to do that if you're also doing district energy. You can't just let the buildings be inefficient and then make a big investment in trying to do district energy. So this is an old rendering, this is probably six, eight years old, it doesn't quite look like this, but this is the general idea that in this industrial area we're gonna have, there's the big grain elevators in the back, but we're gonna have uh, you know, these wonderful walkable pedestrian streets to connect down to the university stadium. That's actually been funded. The city is building that street. It's called Green Fourth Street for about eight blocks. So that becomes one of the amenities that that connects this neighborhood and then demonstrates, you know, other sustainable principles like managing stormwater and stuff. One of the big, district energy has actually been tough to get going here. One of the big success stories is the district stormwater system. You know, every building more or less has to capture all of its rainwater and do something with it. So, and that's a lot to manage and typically you capture that water and it goes down a pipe somewhere into a storm sewer or a drain. It's not used or kept anywhere. <coughs> For environmental reasons, it's much better if you can keep the water on the site, if you can set up uh, kind of a man-made uh, parks and wetlands and water features that allow the, that water to be cleaned and eventually filtrate in. So when you go to a district system, you can do that. And they've done this here. The Mississippi Watershed Management Organization has done a wonderful job with that. Yeah. And uh, using, since we do have quite an excess of, of 
water in our area for using toilets, flushing toilets? It could be used that way. They're, get, they're going to take the next step. Right now, just the idea that people can pool their stormwater together in a cooperative way and use it to create a green space in the middle is, um, is what they've done so far. But there, there's some ideas about re building reuse and more advanced stuff into it. The fourth street housing, if you move past that. Yes, yes, that's right. They, they flush toilets with, with uh, excess storm water. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about two more um, projects very briefly. Um, give you a flavor for this district energy or district systems business. Um, Rochester Destination Medical Center, I imagine people have heard of that. That was passed by the legislature a few years ago. And the general idea is that Mayo Clinic wants to grow tremendously. They want it to become a hub of research and <clears throat> activity and they felt like Rochester is, is now somewhat of a small town. They needed to build uh, the infrastructure and the, the kind of attractive destination town that people want to go to. <coughs> Not just patients, but people in their workforce, among other things. And if there's a lot of new inventions and new technologies that come out of that, they want those businesses to stay in southern Minnesota and grow there and grow the economy. So, so there's this whole you know, once in a lifetime opportunity to kind of remake an existing city with a lot of uh, resources flowing into it. So we play one tiny role in this um, big range of uh, projects going on down there. We were again asked to come in and write the guidelines and those guidelines are again like the other places they really are based on four principles you know we want a sustainable city we want a healthy city and they want to brand this as the healthiest city in america because it's the mayo clinic mm -hmm. we want a vibrant exciting public realm and all of those things together are going to attract the entrepreneurial professional class that they want to attract and keep down there so they want it to become uh, something special and this is our list of guidelines not going to read them just I just have this up here to say they're at the planning scale they're for the streets and corridors and they're for the buildings and so each one of the guidelines at, for example at the planning scale creates sustainable community infrastructure this is setting out the principle of district energy district stormwater there's even district uh, Waste collection, I don't know if you've ever seen that from in Sweden and Germany, they have these vacuum systems and so there's no garbage trucks on the streets. They just collect uh, in some of the big new sustainable development sections that they've done in Stockholm and Berlin and other places like that. They, um, they do that and it allows them to do the waste separation, keeps the trucks off the street, but they even do things like the compost waste that comes from the sinks in an apartment building goes down separate pipes so that it's collected. The organic waste is collected in a separate tank and then that's used to generate biogas that can be used to fuel the, the, uh, you know, the energy for children. So um, Europe's probably 10 or 15 years ahead of us in some of these ways and it's probably related to uh, the way that their government is very, you know, takes over an area of a city and buys it and runs it and leases the land out, but they set up all these infrastructure systems in a much more top-down way than, than we do here. Um, other things that, that contribute to Rochester and all of these guidelines I'm talking about are designing streets for pedestrians. Again, it's about health, it's about um, vibrant public realm, and it's about sustainability all at the same time. It's also a chance to establish the urban forest in a city like Rochester, because we're gonna remake over time all of these streets and corridors. And, uh, and with that, you develop sustainable ways of managing water. We're no longer sending it down the sewer system. We're trying to um, treat it on site. And, uh, okay, I'll sign up. <laughs> <laughs> and treat it on site but it, it can become a real amenity as well. So stormwater, or the term green infrastructure is what some people 
would refer to it as becomes a big part of doing these new cities. And then again, sustainable and healthy building standards. That, that picture uh, is a, essentially a net zero energy building in Seattle that's pretty well known in the world, uh, the sustainability world, you know, and those are the solar collectors on the top. And Richard Graves, uh, who took over the Center for Sustainable Building Research, my old center, um, worked on the Living Building Challenge and uh, knows this building inside out and uh, has a lot of experience with how we can do that here. <coughs> Other things are connect to the district systems, design roofs again for green roofs and solar. So that's what's going on in Rochester and we're just piece by piece trying to infiltrate, so to speak, these communities. And when they have great aspirations, we want to be sustainable, we try to provide them with the tools and rules and things they need to, to make that happen. So now we have a system set up where we do some reviews of the buildings and they have a new energy sustainability coordinator down there that's putting in place a program to similar to St. Paul's program. So, um, I'm very optimistic about it. So the last one I'll talk about is the Ford site in St. Paul. And I'm just going to say that we were involved 10 or 12 years ago when they were first talking about what's this going to become. And uh, Mayor Coleman and, and a lot of the leadership in St. Paul wanted to make this again into a European-style demonstration sustainable community. Um, and so there's been a lot of great top-down leadership and a lot of aspirational thinking and they've brought in people from around the world to look at this and, and try to do something very special here. Um, if you read the papers lately, you know that the neighborhood's pushing back on uh, density and, um, and uh, perceived uh, traffic and things like that. But uh, so each of these situations is different. You know, you want to do these things, but you have to do it in a context. Um, in the context of Prospect Park, the neighborhood's all for it. Density's not a problem. Height's not a problem. Uh, for it is something different, but they'll work through that. So I'm going to finish here with some slides given to me by uh, Richard Graves, who I s spoke of. Uh, director of the Center for Sustainable Building Research. There's his name on there. Um, but that, he did a, a research piece for the Ford site. Um, and we were both on an energy advisory committee. And I think it's a very interesting way to understand the role of solar energy uh, in buildings. Um, it's also part of a Department of Energy, Zero Energy Districts program. So he's um, somehow affiliated with the Department of Energy and trying to get, get this done there. We talked a little bit about the history, of course. It's been the Ford Motor Plant for a long time. There's a hydro uh, dam. The Ford Dam was built to supply energy uh, for that plant. And, uh, and uh, now, after all this time, it becomes this wonderful piece of property right on the river um, that can be developed. Richard took a look at the total solar energy input falling on the site, I think, which is always interesting. Um, these numbers up here are in MWH, but that, they're essentially like that's 579 million kilowatt hours per year, if you want to think of it that way. Um, and then they added this dam, which could provide another 126 million kilowatt hours per year. Uh, to when, when the Ford plant was operating. Now, when they talked about this being a zero energy site, it would have been wonderful if they could count the dam, of course, because there it is, it's all renewable and so forth, but they sold the dam to somebody else. So they don't, when they look at this as a piece of property, the dam isn't, isn't counted. Maybe that's good, they, you know, maybe it, it, it's kind of an easy way to say, oh, we're really energy efficient just because of the luck of having this this uh, free source of renewable energy sitting there, but it's, it's in under private ownership and that just go, goes into the grid. <clears throat> but the part that he did that, that I'm impressed with is he took the plan, the development plans as they are now, looked at the scale sizes of the buildings, what 
is likely to be built there if they follow the current master plan. And just said, what's the energy use if I build this to the building code today? And the number up in the corner is 60 million uh, kWh per year. Okay, remember that number, 60 million. Oh, usually the problem is getting on the internet. You know? It's like you can't get off it. Um, so this, this is the diagram of where we're trying to get to in, in energy use uh, that I was speaking of before. Um, this benchmark, this 100 at the top, is you know, the average building stock. He says here in the year 2000, this says 2003. But it's basically that, that benchmark we started with. And then the building codes in those early days were around here, maybe 20% better than that average building. Now our Minnesota code is about here. It's about 45 to 50%. I think we have the 2010 code in place. At some point, we'll have the 2013. So we've, we've come halfway with the building code anyway. But here's our 2030 goals. 2010, we had to be here. 2015, we had to be at 30. 70% less, or 30% is the remaining load. 2020, which is really right around the corner, a couple of years now, um, we're gonna have to be at 20%. So any buildings that are gonna be built with public money in, in the next, during the time frame of this fourth thing are, are gonna have to meet that, that 20 level. So if you take that 20 level, you go from 60 million BTUs a year to 26 million BTUs a year. So you're getting this huge, almost 60% reduction from today's building code on, on all of this in energy. And you want to get that energy down reasonably. You know, we believe it's cost effective to do this um, because the profession has learned how to do it over a period of 10 or 15 years. Now, if you put solar on all the roofs on site, um, remember we have 26 million is the load that we're trying to meet. The PV on site would, would meet 15 million of that. So uh, leaving only 10 million in energy use we'd have to bring in. So remember we started at 60, now we're down to 10. And uh, you can see the role solar plays, but the, the solar wouldn't do it by itself if we didn't do all this energy conservation on the buildings at the same time. Um, so there's a couple ways to look at that. You could say, well, let's, let's imagine that the electricity grid changes over time or we're allowed to select, purchase renewable energy credits or something like that. We could, in theory, say, we'll, take, we'll make up that, that 10 million with renewables and then we'll get to zero. We probably can't do it with solar alone. Um, the other way to think about it, and this is the study going on right now with District Energy, St. Paul people, um, is what if we put in a, uh, a District Energy system on site that, and this is, uh, this is called an aquifer thermal energy system, which is, you could think of it like geothermal, but it's just a deeper thing. It goes down into the aquifer and uses the temperature of the water in the aquifer. So that would make, um, essentially, if you call that renewable energy generated on site, um, that's another 15. So now we've got a 5 million kWh per year sur surplus. So what this all tells me is um, we can do this. We can do this today. This isn't like magic. We can, we can get the building loads down. People are doing it now. Um, the solar is a very important piece of, that can be added to that and it's becoming more cost effective all the time. And then we can find other ways to, to make up the gap. So um, I just thought this was a really interesting um, approach to thinking about this and to think about it more at this community or neighborhood scale is, is useful. Yeah? For the geothermal, geothermal energy is not really creating energy, it's really a heat balance. Um, how do they figure out how much energy is it just the offset of the HVAC system that we would be? Yeah, you're not going to ask. I'll get in trouble trying to <laughs> pretend I'm an engineer. But, um, you know, they're looking for a source of, of heat. I mean, it's the way an air. 
so, so the, the water in the ground is, is warmer in the winter and cooler in the summer than the air outside. And so heat pumps essentially can draw from that. And they convert that to KDT? Yeah. It gets converted. So in effect, yeah, they're able to say, we're providing X amount from, of energy from this. And they're counting the energy it takes to run the electricity and the heat pumps and stuff. So anyway, um, I'll stop there. It's 7 o'clock. I'm just amazed that I'm on time one way or the other. Yeah. Is Richard related to microgrades? The architect, you mean? No, I don't think so. No. And the other comment, if you look at Minneapolis from the air or whatever, you see in the summer, you see trees. Yeah. So that uh, limits the amount of solar energy we can get a roofs. So in this case, you know, the trees be uh, all of well, I think uh, that's a good question. I think this is a lot of these are envisioned as maybe six story buildings like this drawing here, and so the trees aren't an issue for that. The roof is up high enough. I suppose if they were two story buildings, would be, it would be more of a problem. Um, but you know, the trees have the benefit of shading the buildings, reducing air conditioning loads, lowering the, the um, the heat island, essentially the built up urban temperatures. And so uh, the trees play a role, I guess you just have to design all these complementary pieces. Yeah. So I'm up in Prospect Park going forward, but somebody wants to do a new building and renovate the building right now. They have to meet these guidelines that are set up for that area. Um, and is there like a committee or a separate building inspector? Or okay, well, you're, you're getting to the heart of the issue. I was sort of speaking like they're in place. They are definitely in place in St. Paul. They are... In the St. Paul side of the... Well, in, in, in St. Paul, anytime you get public money, it triggers yes, the size of money. That's going to essentially be the same trigger in Rochester. Um, no, I'm, when I say it, I say it like it's all in place right now. Okay. And the reality is it's... It's, it's a work in progress. That's the tricky part. And how you enforce that through a partnership. And uh, the public places there are established people just would be able to tie into those. I mean, they don't have to provide anything themselves as part of the project. What? Or walkways or something like that. Right. You mean an individual landowner? Yeah. Yeah. They, yeah. If, 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 the creation of the public realm and so forth. I don't know exactly how it works in terms of what a building owner is responsible for in terms of building the boulevards and sidewalks in front of his house, but these grand avenues and things are, and parks, they're, they're not being paid for directly by individual property owners as far as I understand. Um, there can be situations where property owners decide to donate land toward the public realm and, and make that kind of contribution and they might do that in exchange for getting a higher density on their property or some other trade-off. Yeah. I have two more questions. Sure. Is the Ford Dam, or what do you call the Ford Dam, yeah. is it producing electricity now? Yes, it is. Yeah. It is. And somebody, a private company, bought it. So, and then I like your business of actually reporting energy use. And uh, has anyone studied that? Is th does it reflect what the studies did before the building was built? Before this building was built? Um, you mean what they projected it was going to be? Um, not necessarily. And so that's a, I, I think that the, the first part of the green building movement was everybody was busy trying to build the, all these buildings. And then when they actually looked at how they operated, Sometimes they did just fine, but other times they didn't. Yeah. And sometimes that's normal because a building is complicated and it's kind of like a shakedown cruise on a ship. The first year they figure out how to operate it, figure out what's wrong. So you might see a big spike in one year and then it'll flatten out. But in, there's other times when it actually tells you that, gee, the calculations were wrong or it's not being operated the way it's we thought it would operate. So, it, 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 but the key is to have some feedback yeah. so we can imp steadily improve and understand what we're doing. And with buildings, we aren't always very good at that. 
Is a lead rate tracking site available at the moment? I, it, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It's certainly available to you as a state agency to see all your own buildings. Well, and as an architect, I can find like, the cities and the, the um, Yeah. Cities. How public that whole thing is is a good question. I, I can't answer that now because I'm a little out of the loop. Well, what are they going to have to do? So those buildings you're telling they, they meet the 2020 standard. Yeah. And then there's the 2030. And they just put more insulation in the walls? Or what are they going to do to meet that? Well, no, I think uh, what I was saying earlier was you can kind of get to that 2015 standard by insulation and better lights and better windows and, all, and better mechanical systems. But once you get to that point, it's pretty hard to squeeze it down any further. You can have all the insulation in the world, and it's not going to change it very so much. So how are they going to get from 2020? Renewable energy. That's, energy. Yeah, okay. that's my message today. <coughs> renewable energy finally has a, a very needed role here. Because to get to those levels, you do have to add the renewables, I think. Yeah. John, what, in all these projects that you're involved with, is there a lot of discussion or no discussion like on energy storage and microgrids and things like that? Or, I mean, are they taking them that far? Or, you know? Well, I, when, when you get down to the details of like the district energy system design, yes, they would, they would be doing that. Like Evergreen Energy in St. Paul, who's a consultant on several of these projects, would, would be doing that analysis and incorporating in uh, some of those advanced ideas, but they don't, at this kind of <clears throat> broad level I'm looking at, it doesn't. Because yeah, I, I was just thinking, you know, they've got a lot going on with renewables, with solar, but, you know, if you don't complete that cycle and put some storage or something, yeah. then it doesn't, you know, it doesn't work there as well, so. Yeah, I have to ask Richard about that, but I, about the assumptions underlying the analysis we did and how much storage is involved. Just part of that storage, I think they were looking at um, electric cars off and offset, you know. Yeah. Well, there's some other, you know, the other thing in city planning that's such a wild card these days is the idea of autonomous vehicles and that some people are really saying it's going to be like the iPhone in five to ten years from now where none of us are going to be driving our own cars. And, uh, whether you believe that or not, you have to think about what would you do as a city planner because now you don't need parking spaces on the street. That fleet will just move around and pick people up like a bunch of Uber cars and they'll, it'll disappear. And you'll need a lot fewer cars. You know, most of our cars sit unused 90% of the time. So you need about 10% of the cars and they'll just be programmed to run around and pick everybody up. So you don't need parking spaces, you don't need parking ramps. You're making big investments in parking ramps that are going to have to be torn down and converted to something else. So uh, streets could get greener, uh, but it's it's such a wild card in so many ways. You just don't really know what to do <laughs> with that in terms of making investments and understanding how to plan for it. Yes. I'm wondering why they don't use the 2030 standard instead of the 2020 standard for making new ordinances. Well, you certainly could do that. I mean, it's the idea that back when we started this in 2008, you couldn't go to zero immediately. The 2030 standard basically says you've got to be net zero energy. And this is sort of a way of saying, we're going to raise the bar every five years so that the industry adapts and feels like they can meet those goals and get there. And it looks like that's happening. Anybody's welcome to go to zero if they want to. And there are a lot of quote unquote net zero buildings out there, but um, yeah, we wouldn't require it, I guess, is the way to think of it. Yes? So is that in the 2030s sequence of progressing to zero, Yeah. Um, mean if, if we were to build a building today, we would need to meet the 2020 standard. And then it's the probably going to come in place on January 1st, 2020. There will be a, it, it, when you start that building, it, okay. it's probably that. So, so you'd be I'm under the 15 regime right now, the 2015. Okay, but, then, but, but I guess my question is, 
does it is it able through the life of that building to stay at that standard, or is it supposed to make improvements every five years? No, no, no. it doesn't. It, if it's built in 2015, it just that's as good as it's going to get. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could you're not forced to keep making it better, but it's it's turning over the whole building stock. Reasonable way. So I've gone over here now. Thank you all very oh, much. Thank you.